Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 18 of Unscripted Equity Curiosity. My name is Ami Joseph. I'm the Sector Head for Technology here at Hedgeye. With me today is Joseph Fates, but the Director of Technology at Hedgeye. We are hopefully going to be joined by Felix and Andrew, our usual compatriots in this free Hedgeye podcast, which discusses all kinds of different things, all equity-related, all curiosity-related, sometimes macro, sometimes thematic. And sometimes it's data and sometimes it's idea generation that spontaneously happens on our show. And as I mentioned, we've got three seasons of this. This is the 18th episode of the current season. You can go back on Apple and Spotify to find previous podcasts, or you can search on the Hedgeye website, or for convenience, just go to at Hedgeye Tech and scroll down to all my recent, all my posts, because that is where I post every single episode that we have done. Today, we have two special guests, Todd Jordan and Sean Jenkins. They are the GLL team, the gaming, lodging, and leisure leisure team here at Hedgeye, covering an important part of the consumer equity market. And both Todd and Sean are experts in this space. Todd's been doing it forever. Sean's been doing it for six years, seven, seven years now. Um, and uh, eight years uh, sorry, you've earned all those eight years. I know I, I, I won't, I won't, I won't mention how many, but it's, it's like me, it's up there in the 20 plus range. Um, and, um, today we're going to learn from, from Todd and Sean, uh, and it's part of the series we've been doing that started about, uh, five weeks ago with Brian McGough and Jeremy McLean that continued with Felix and also continued with Howard Penny in the most recent installment and what we're doing today is an introduction to GLL. We're going to ask some of the basic questions like, hey guys, I'm a newbie here in GLL and I don't know my butt from my elbow. So let's help me figure this all out. Uh, so Todd and Sean, I'm going to throw the question that you guys can take uh, take it, both, each of you take it and then uh, turn it back or, or take turns answering the different questions. But the first question is, all right, it's my first day on being Mr. Buy Side GLL. Uh, what do I do? Like, I, where do I go? What do I, what do I need to, which, what are the, who are the top five stocks that I need to like get to learn right away? And when I'm learning them, like, what are the key metrics that I'm going to have to like be petrified of as a short? And what are the key things that I, I should like think about and be like, oh my God, this could be amazing. So uh, both of you, each of you should answer that question. If you have a, then we can, we can flow from there. Sure. Sure. It's a lot of questions in one. How much time do we have here, Ami? Seven uh, or eight hours. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Very big. Long yeah, form podcast. It, it's, uh, I mean, you know, look, it's a cyclical space, right? Uh, so I, I think you need to know the macro drivers and also how these subsec su subsectors actually sort of interrelate with each other. Because you know, if you go look at the sell side, uh, you know, they don't cover the whole gamut, you know, it, and, and we think that's kind of crazy, right? So, uh, you have people who cover hotels, but don't cover the OPAs, right? And, uh, you know, they compete with each other. They work with each other. Uh, they're driven by some of the same overall trends, but then there's other issues too. One's a faster growing industry, the OTA, uh, more leisure based. Yeah, the hotels also have this business component, but there is a lot of interaction between between the two. Uh, so I think, you know, big picture, I think you, you should really cover the whole travel landscape, right? Which we which we do. Uh, but then I think you, understand, you have to understand within the subsectors, even though they are under the the leisure realm for the most part, uh, you know, hotels obviously uh, have that business component as well. Uh, I, I think you have to understand what the the macro, since they are all cyclical, what the macro drivers are of each because they are different. Now I don't go into some hedge fund office and say, "Hey, you know, you got to short these stocks because I think the economy sucks, or I think the economy is great, right?" Uh, because you're not going to pay me for that. I'm not a macro analyst, and neither is, is Sean. Although we, you know, pretend like we are sometimes. But what we try to do, though, <laughs> is to obviously present sort of the hedge eye macro view as, uh, you know, part of the process. But but within that, how do our stocks or subsectors actually react under different macro regimes. And it's not just an overall macro, like we're going into a recession. What does that mean? You, you have to look at the, 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 even get down, you know, deeper into the macro on what drives each subsector. So for instance, uh, for, for casinos, for a long time, 
uh, we've analyzed this industry and come to the conclusion statistically, not just because you know we we think it makes sense, but statistically shown that GDP is not the the biggest macro driver. Unemployment is not the biggest macro driver. Really, the ma- the biggest macro driver of casino revenues is real estate wealth or housing prices because. <laughs> The average now I can justify it. I can you know make sense. The average age of a casino gambler is up close to sixty years old. They're less concerned with current disposable income and more concerned with uh, the value of or, or their, their wealth, right? Which is mostly driven by the value of their home. So we've analyzed this over the years, and it's in almost every single market. If you look at it over time, uh, that real estate component becomes the number one driver. A macro driver of of revenues, whereas if you get into uh, maybe uh, you know online sports betting, right? Not necessarily right now because it's 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 sort of in its infancy of of growth, and there's so much organic growth built in. But if if it was a more mature industry, uh, millennials tend to be the uh, biggest demographic, and they are much more concerned with disposable. Uh, disposable income, right? So that's a different segment than what we call brick and mortar uh, casino gaming. Then you you could take Vegas and say, okay, well, Vegas, yeah, they they have a big casino component, but that's well less than 50% of the revenues. Uh, you have to fly there. There's the hotel component, food and beverage, entertainment, everything else, which makes it actually more cyclical in a traditional sense of you know GDP related, unemployment related than does a, a regional gaming property, which is 90% uh, you know, casino revenues versus the other stuff, right? So there are different things that you have to pay attention to, but I think you start with the big picture, right? What's your what's your view on on overall leisure spend? And uh, you know what? We've been positive on leisure travel for a long time for for so many reasons. It's easier. It's generally used to you know get cheaper, more options. You know, we've alternative accommodation, Airbnb. Um, you know, the OTAs make it cheaper, uh, more competition. Uh, but there's been a sea change since COVID, and it's really, uh, if you look at the slope of the leisure travel line, line, it's gone from, you know, very nice long-term growth to sort of really going like that because it's not just millennials anymore that want to uh, that favor experiences over things to you know that's the phrase everybody uses, but it's my generation, Generation X. Uh, we have we have changed. We uh, have less interest in goods, consumer goods. We're more interested in spending on experiences, and uh, you know the biggest part of that would be you know leisure travel. So uh, you know that's our kind of our big picture view. Now, if you're looking more near term, you kind of have to worry about well, has there been revenge travel, pent up demand? You know, is that ending soon, and what happens then? But if you're looking long term, the slope I think has gone up dramatically. So I think it's a good place to be in a general sense uh, over the long term. Um, so, uh, you know, I think from that perspective, that's sort of where we we start with kind of the, the top down, and then we look at within that, you know, what are the what are these subsectors? Uh, what do we like in the subsectors uh, from a secular uh, perspective? Um, you know, and you could pull out one or two companies in, in each subsector uh, that I think you know w- would be the bellwethers to look at leisure overall, right? So the 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 OTA subsector, you know. Booking.com is is the premier operator, uh, just a fantastically run company, probably the best in our space. And if it's not, that it would be Hilton, which would be on the hotel brand company side, a major company uh, that we think is a bellwether uh, for the space. Within casinos, you know, it's probably MGM. Uh, MGM would be the one domestically, um, but then you've got you know the whole Macau angle. So there's a lot of space, even though there there's this this again this this overlying or underlying, you know, leisure component to it. There are so many secular factors going on in all of these subsectors that, um, you know, you, you have to be macro and, and micro aware. So uh, I think cruise lines, maybe you'd throw in a Royal Caribbean would be you know, sort of a bellwether, yeah. a leisure name, right? That's very, very tied to, to leisure travel, very, very cyclical. Uh, again, COVID has changed things, so there's catch up going on, right? So you know maybe they outperform, uh, even if we start to go to a downturn, because cruise lines are just still recovering, right? So you're, it's it's a recovery space uh, relative to hotels, for instance, re- leisure resort hotels that have you know just performed enormously well. Uh, so I think that would be uh, that would be my as quick as I can uh, boil it down. My answer to your your questions. 
That's an awesome start, Sean. You want to throw in some additional bullets? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'll come at it from a slightly different angle, um, but but all related topics. I think Todd has you know hit the nail on the head in terms of figuring out um, you know our our space is generally leisure focused, but I think as a as an analyst that started at Hedgeye and sort of worked from the ground up alongside my first day to day mentor being Felix, who who had just has just joined us here on the podcast, but Todd obviously being the overarching mentor. Um, uh, figuring out what your customer mix is and what really drives whether it's room demand or like Todd had mentioned on the casino side and regional markets, uh, sort of the next layer from understanding, you know, whether uh, uh, GDP is a, a major driver or whether it's housing prices or in hotels, uh, GDP does matter a lot more than than say it does for gaming. But it's not just GDP; it's actually private non residential fixed investment that is actually the highest corollary and the most important driver behind what really is business travel and convention travel and group travel. But I'll take it a little bit step back and Todd had sort of started on a 30,000 foot view. If I take it down to 25,000 foot view, really understanding that the different subsectors of GLL cruise lines and timeshare being basically 100% leisure. So if you have a good appreciation, good understanding, and you know how to track the leisure economy, you're, you got a good head start on those stocks. Those ones you can start to understand. With cruise, there's a bit more nuance. And certainly in today's age with the whole timing of recoveries um, and and the catch-up trade like Todd had indicated, um, there's, there's things to consider there. But then you move further down the spectrum of Las Vegas Strip, which is about 85% leisure and gaming driven with the, with the balance being you know, your broader convention, which can be about a little less than half of that convention is corporate. The other part of the convention is is trade shows and uh, you know big union associations and different meetings that come into town um, and that have really counter cyclical almost drivers because these are groups that meet every three to five years and no matter what they're going to meet in Vegas or they're going to meet in Orlando and Vegas has done a tremendous job of of cultivating that business and it's not they're not big spenders in the casino or in the retail stores or at high end restaurants but they fill up the rooms. So it creates extra compression that you can then uh, really push price into your other uh, into your other demand drivers. Then, if you move a little bit further into the hotel space, you have the lower end hotels, which are about seventy five percent, seventy ish, seventy to seventy five percent leisure based, with the balance being uh, business transient and very little group of that business transient. Think about uh, roadside hotels. Who's going to those? Ami, you and I aren't typically doing a ton of meetings out in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, but hey, maybe someone who works for a logistics company or a construction company or who is involved in infrastructure, um, you'll be staying at those hotels on the regular because that's where those hotels are positioned. And you move even further and you get into the Marriott's and Hilton's and Hyatt's of the world where you know less than 40% or about 40% of their business is driven by leisure with the balance being you know, that more white collar uh, corporate, large corporate business travel or travel that we all do for for hedge. I call us a small medium uh, business, and then you have the 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 other components that drive a lot of their uh, room demand are are on the corporate side, and um, you know forty percent is a lot different than being a hundred percent leisure exposed. So I think what's really in- has been interesting for me as a, as a newer analyst, which is now a couple of years ago, like I said, eight, eight years ago, really understanding that uh, it's all GLL. But there's 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 so much nuance at the subsector level, and if we can get all the way to the to to, to the one end of the spectrum, uh, which is most sort of corporate and business, and probably more GDP exposed, is the full service hotel REITs. So these guys own the land, they own the operations, and they pay either Marriott, Hilton, or Hyatt a franchise and management fee to essentially run the operations. So they have the in good times when the economy is accelerating and it's quad one or quad two. And uh, sort of pre-COVID when business travel was more of a thing, now it's a little bit um, not outdated. I'll just say we, we've had a theory and we've largely been right that uh, the bar has been reset on business travel and there's just less of it on a volume basis. So you might recover in nominal terms in what we call RevPAR terms, but your business occupancy that you used to have Monday through Thursday or Monday through Wednesday, Thursday is sort of the new Friday now. I didn't know if you knew that, Ami. Um, cause people take long weekends, but, um, 
that business is just not going to be what it once was. And that's still three and a half years into this whole COVID thing. That's still still the case. Return to office, all that affects those guys a lot more. So regardless of how well they do on the leisure side, which a lot of them have, have over-earned and done extremely well, they've been very affected by this whole secular change in how we travel for for work. Um, and uh, anyway, that's just sort of the, the broader spectrum of a lot of leisure to uh, decidedly less leisure. And, and there's been a lot of unique Im- implications coming out of COVID um, that macro that are, that are sort of uh, uh, irrespective of the macro environment, more behavioral changes that we all have to consider as well. Todd already hit it on hit hit, hit on the main stocks that I would also uh, highlight. But there's we do cover timeshare companies as well, which 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 are an important uh, industry to understand. Certainly less they're not as big as as the hotels. M- more of the room demand uh, flows through through hotels and now alternative accommodation. But timeshare is a an interesting pocket of the industry. Merit vacations. At VACs, the ticker is a name that we do cover. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, I don't think we talked about. I guess we we didn't talk about hotel REITs, which, but uh, or in Todd's initial uh, intro there. But uh, HST Host Hotels is is one of the largest uh, uh, REITs out there. Hotel uh, Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, they uh, uh, they own, gosh, over over eighty hotels in the U.S. Over ten billion market cap company, so so decent size. Uh, certainly was a lot bigger pre-COVID uh, from a market market cap and enterprise value perspective, but um, but those are interesting. You know, other other sort of industries that are important to our broader coverage space that that people should be focused on, or a new analyst would would be focused on. But very different business than say Hilton or or a Marriott uh, than is a uh, host. Did the timeshare investor relations people offer you a hundred bucks to come sit in their investor relations presentation <laughs> if you'll come <laughs> all right well listen but todd and, and sean i i have a ton of follow-ups but we're going to uh, turn over to andrew for a minute here because he's got uh, a question as well so we're going to continue with andrew andrew yeah just a quick question and um i'm sure i actually got a call the other day <laughs> arizona area code asking if i want to sell my timeshare that i had uh but i don't have a timeshare so i thought it was, uh, it was annoying. I'll sell it. You know? uh, but, sell, um, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe a fit, this day and age, right? Sell something that you don't have. Um, the uh, Just a question. You mentioned, Sean, the timing of recoveries. Um, I'm just curious, like at a high level, like where are we on this kind of U.S. recovery versus international recovery and it impacting, you know, visitation and, you know, mix shifts and supporting the year-over-year comparisons? Um for some of the companies you, you track. Yeah, absolutely. And domestically, domestically, mostly I'm interested in just because I'm thinking about like Disney parks and like Live Nation. Um, but, you know, I'm just at a high level. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll just give some recovery data and then kick it over uh, to, to Todd for some, for some extra color. But um, just for context, we did a really cool presentation with uh, Howard's team and Brian's team uh, in early July, which really was trying to look closer at the goods and services economy. And then within that, see how our subsectors are performing. But for some interesting context, if you look at just the retail brick and mortar uh, uh, sales trends and the recovery in that segment, you basically were at or, or growing against pre-COVID levels in September of 2020. So huge, huge recovery that you know was a V-shaped recovery for, for that industry. It was obvious we all needed to consume. We couldn't travel. We couldn't do certain things. We couldn't go to restaurants for a little bit, little while too. That recovered first, and then so that's you know over two years ago now. Uh, restaurants then recovered in January and February of 2021. It took the lodging and leisure recovery, and this is does not include cruise lines, so X cruise lines, all the way until April of 22 to get back to call it 2019 levels. So a lot longer. Um, uh, for that recovery. And then what's interesting is cruise lines really didn't start recovering until kind of the exit rate out of Q1 of this year. So you have this really unique staggered uh, recovery and it doesn't directly answer your question in terms of inbound international and outbound international, but you could kind of, the the the, the cruise recovery has taken the longest and it was the, the latest to start back up. Uh, certainly about three years after uh, you've seen the recovery in retail and restaurants or two and a half years, I should say. Um, but, uh, but that sort of us outbound travel really didn't start recovering until last summer, 
Um, and there's been a huge pent up demand for that. And what's interesting is you haven't gotten the same amount of inbound travel to the US, one, because of strong dollar, two, because we had additional COVID restrictions, which, which finally rolled off in May of this year. And there's been just a lack of lack of airlift to a lot of countries that we used to get a lot of inbound travel from uh, being uh, uh, the Far East and Asia Pacific region in particular, which has sort of slowed that recovery. So there is a massive, it's not just our rhetoric and us pushing our leisure uh, ideas onto folks. There is, you know, irrefutable evidence to suggest that there's just been such a delay and staggered recovery within uh, GLL uh, relative to the rest of the economy. Really more the LL, lodging and lodging and leisure, or call it global lodging and leisure. But Todd, back to you for yeah. No, I should say there's there's just different ways to look at recovery too. There's versus yeah. nineteen, and then there's uh, we've had a lot of economic growth obviously since 2019, right? And uh, we we like to look at leisure spend as a percent of the uh, of the wallet, so wallet share essentially, consumer wallet. And from that perspective, you know we're just getting caught up uh, on a you know sort of trend basis to that. So the question from here is when we do catch up, where does it go? Right? Does it? The, you know, this. I'm I'm fairly convinced that the the slope of the line is going higher. Uh, it's just, does it go higher? You know, does it keep going higher now? Does it back off for a little bit because of macro concerns? Because you know, people have already traveled a lot in the last year or two. Um, and then there's also the comparison with with, with Europe too, right? Because our contention is that not that the U.S. will become Europe, but it's becoming more like Europe. So. I think the uh, prospects for for growth, for long term growth, for U.S. leisure travel is higher than it is for Europe. You know, I think vacation days are going up. Uh, people uh, tacking on, um, you know, more apt to tack on uh, leisure after business trips. People just taking uh, working from home or working from another location, which could be ca- characterized as a, a leisure trip if you decide you want to be in warm weather. And I've done this too during COVID. I, I was in Charleston for three weeks and just booked an Airbnb to be close to my daughter who was at school. And I, you know, I worked every day, but it's technically, you know, a leisure trip. So uh, in vacation days, um, you know, time off, all that other stuff is moving more towards Europe. I don't think we're, we're ever going to get there, uh, but moving more towards Europe. So that's a long-term tailwind as well. Awesome. This is a, a great intro um, overall. I've got so many follow-up questions, but the first one I want to hit on, and and maybe Todd will start with you and then Sean will come to you. You mentioned five different companies as uh, kind of like the, the kind of like highlight companies and Sean, you added a couple as well. Um, I wanted to know like just from a, like almost like a market neutral or macro neutral, you know, kind of view why, if you take Booking.com, let's say for example, that was the first one you called out. Um, what makes them, when you analyze that business, what makes them so great? And can you contrast it with somebody who's a POS, who uh, who you're, who when you contrast those two, it sort of becomes obvious that like you're like, oh my god, this other thing is like terrible. And <clears throat> same question with Hilton, like why do you call out Hilton where I don't have any? Uh, almost no points at all, uh, and I'm and I'm, why is that the winner? Why did I choose to not have my credit card with Hilton? And anyway, that's a side point. But like the point is, what when you're analyzing Hilton's business, what makes Hilton stand out as amazing? Uh, and who's the comp that you would say is doing it all wrong? And what are those factors? Let's go with like sort of like a, a, a strictly like almost like a market neutral like long short view with those with those two questions right there. Sure. Uh, so we'll start with the OTAs. Um, booking trades at something like 15, 14, 15 times EBITDA, Expedia trades at five times EBITDA, essentially the same business. Um, I think that's pretty interesting and tells you what the market thinks of, of those two companies. Uh, the, the good news is you know, Expedia is actually doing a lot of things to become more like booking. Uh, so they're playing catch up, right? But nobody believes it'll happen. Um, but at least you have the disparity in valuation, right? If you're actually going to look at maybe trying to play that catch up and that recovery with uh, with Hilton versus we would we would have Marriott on the other side. You've essentially got the same valuation, yet Hilton we think is the much better company, and uh, you know not just looking at today's uh, Revpar index, for instance, where Hilton's 
uh, revenue revenue per available room. It's basically room rate times occupancy. Their growth is outpacing Marriott. It's not just about the near term. It's about the long term. These companies grow over the long term primarily by other people or other developers building their hotels and using the flag either through a franchise arrange, arrangement or a management arrangement with Hilton or or Marriott or you know all their brands, right? And the the returns. This is the the you know, probably the most important differentiator. The returns to those developers are much higher on the Hilton brands than they are on the Marriott brands. So that net unit growth, which drives a ton of growth and probably is uh, you know the, the the most important factor or one of the most important factors to um, pretty healthy valuations generally for hotel C corps to be differentiated from the hotel owners like the REIT Sean brought up, but just the C corps which run an asset light business. Uh, if you have a better long term outlook for growth. Uh, which we think Hilton does by far uh, in advance of, of Marriott, then you know you should have a much bigger valuation. At this point in time, they do not have different valuations. They are pretty much valued the same. They're both good businesses. Hilton is just much better run. They've had a process of uh, driving better returns uh, to their owners, uh, really nailing um, new brand introductions uh, that, you know, um, you know, obviously, when you hit the right chain scale at the right time with the right product, you can do really, really well. And if you just look at their pipelines, I mean, you can compare and contrast their pipelines uh, of new hotels. And Hilton has way more as a percentage of their total pipeline actually under construction, where the cancellation rates are really, really low. Marriott has a, too much of its pipeline in the planning phase, where the cancellation rates are really high, right? You don't have financing yet. And we haven't talked about like the financing issue, but you know, I mean, that's going to be a real issue for the whole industry, but at least Hilton has more of their pipeline in in hotels that are already uh, either under construction or already getting uh, financing. But the key is the returns are higher. And um, Hilton has uh, a lot of their growth reliant on brands that have already proven themselves. So you've already gotten to a critical mass of, you know, 150 hotels where developers are like, all right, this thing works. You know, we can see the return data. We have a, you know, a great sample size where Marriott's really relying on uh, unproven growth. So I would use that on the hotel side as a great company versus a not so great company. Back to the OTAs, booking has just been, uh, you know, this is the the old price line. Uh, they've just been, you know, well, uh, just looking forward uh, much longer than any other company. And with with technology, but also with marketing, um, and and uh, just the 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 ability to really um, figure out what drives returns on marketing spend uh, much better than Expedia has previously. Booking has also had the advantage of um, essentially you know fewer brands to market over so they, they just have much of more efficient uh, scale. Uh, whereas Expedia and this is not the current management team's fault, but um, Expedia just kept you know way back when in the 2000s uh, just kept buying brands left and right. <clears throat> and that's uh, really inefficient. You know, and so this management team is actually for Expedia has been scaling down uh, to fewer brands, basically marketing over three brands now: Verbo Hotels and the Hotels.com and the Expedia brand, uh, which has been, um, you know, we think really the right strategy. In fact, when we didn't like this stock a number of years ago, uh, we laid out all the issues we had, and and they've really attacked a lot of those, a lot of those issues. So um, I think Expedia is on the right path. The problem is it's a real proven to me stock, as you can tell by by the valuation. But at least, you know, I don't feel like uh, I feel like the, the the valuation probably overcompensates for the difference. You know, I'm never going to say Expedia is a better company than than Booking, but is it is it is it is it, is it a ten you know even that multiple difference? I don't think so. You know, the the clearer like pair trade for us is more on the uh, the C corp side with Hilton versus Marriott. Sean, do you want to comment on either of those two and add detail, or do you want to pick on either Royal Caribbean versus a peer or HST versus a peer or any kind of other, just giving us detail on like why one would be a long and one would be a short in terms of like the overall business in terms of, you know, kind of, kind yeah. of calling out. I'll, uh, I'll jump to HST, but not take it from the standpoint of it being a premier name to own relative to the other two, but just from a, I sort of, a, I sort of took that one as a good one to, to sink. If you're a new analyst to sink your teeth into to learn the hotel read business, but 
I'll, I'll, I'll actually pick uh, another hotel re and contrast that with the space, which we do not like the space. It's not a great business. A lot of it being due to exposure, but a lot of it being due to mismanagement, bad balance sheets, over levered, um, like we had mentioned the operating leverage, but there's also financial leverage for a number of these hotel REITs. Host HST is not one of them, but well, I'll call out RHP, Ryman Hospitality, uh, as a hotel REIT that stands well above the rest in term. And really, to put it simply, it comes down to their exposure. They are um, heavily exposed to the group and convention business. They are exposed in the right markets that are business friendly, that are fairly supply constrained for their segment, which is again, group convention, trade shows, incentive management travel, and uniquely positioned in shoulder periods to what we deem to be seasonal leisure travel. So these are hotels that they may be big, big boxes that have thousands of rooms and tons of meeting and convention space, and they absolutely crush it in that segment, which is, by the way, not subject to a lot of the negatives that we called out related to business travel being uh, you know, a se- long-term secular loser, we think, is business travel. But conventions and group travel and trade shows, these are once a year to once every three-year events that there's going to be demand for them. It's not a growth industry per se, but RHP, given where they're positioned in Nashville and Orlando, and uh, they have a, a property just outside of um, uh, Denver and Colorado, they have now two properties in Texas. Um, they they are positioned in markets that people want to travel to, that they can then tack on leisure trips to. And again, they have fresh product that is so differentiated from, say, a host or Pebble Brook or Park Hotels, which is uh, affiliated mostly with the Hilton brand, um, but they own all the bad Hiltons. So think about the New York Midtown Hilton, uh, that old dinosaur of, a, of an asset that has gotten some CapEx dollars over the last few years, but essentially RHP, their competition is big boxes and markets that, you know, do you really want to go to a convention in San Francisco right now? Uh, or would you rather go to Nashville in a brand new hotel that has fresh room product and fresh convention space and tack on an extra day and and take your wife or meet some friends in downtown Nashville. They have hit it the nail right on the head in terms of where people want to travel to uh, and maintain their their properties. And the margins show um, they have a, a unique differentiated um, uh, uh, ability to revenue manage versus their, their hotel re peers in that because they do so much group and convention business, that business books out at 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 most two to three years out, but for the most part, six to twelve months is sort of their their booking curve. So they have a level of visibility three to six months out that no one else really has. Certainly, other hotel REITs do group and convention business, but really, it's more city driven. Whereas RHP is actually because of their asset type. And because of their longstanding relationships with a lot of these groups, they're able to get the whatever convention uh, or, or association, a gymnastics association that has 10,000 members that meets once a year in Nashville or meets in Orlando or meets in uh, in Denver at their Rockies property. And then they can layer in smaller groups, say a Hedge Eye Live type, of, type convention or something like that. So they have this unique ability um, to revenue manage and really yield up their spare rooms um, with extra leisure business, and they don't have to rely on business transient guests that are very cyclical and subject to the purse strings of any corporation. These are these are events that certainly in downturns you have to worry about. There are cancellations, but they generate cancellation uh, revenue because these are contracts that have been booked and signed uh, and 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 arranged. So. The margin differential for them, they're in the mid 30s on EBITDA margins relative to their peers, where sub 30% is a lot of that's due to how much they can sort of uh, uh, pre book and then layer in and yield up their, their remaining customer base. So it comes down to customer segmentation, geo segmentation, and then also the fact that the management team, they're not just transaction focused real estate people, they are operators. They know what they're doing, they know the market's cold. 
um, which is a big differentiator relative to their peers that are at the end of the day, sort of spreadsheet people. And they want to buy things cheap and, and, and sell things high when in fact they do just the opposite a lot of the time and aren't great market timers and, uh, uh, stewards of capital. So those are those that's in hotel REIT space We're we currently don't have RHP on our best idea long list, but it has been, and it's been an awesome pair against pretty much every other hotel read for the last yeah more, more than just a 10 years i yeah. mean it's the, i mean these guys just look at a stock chart over you know uh, an extended period of time uh these you know i would say for uh, to classify a read as a good relative management team uh they'd be a team that didn't destroy value because all my right. thoughts would do uh rhp has created value you wanted that with that management team and so a lot of their Stuff you might say, oh, they're you know they're lucky to be in leisure markets. They're lucky to be in the group convention business. No, they they had the foresight to get into these markets. Absolutely. Okay, I okay. So I now I have I have like several follow ups. Um, I guess maybe my first follow up because we met, you talked about how booking versus Expedia. One of the differences was that Expedia had layered itself with M and A. Um, and then the, now they're deconsolidating and that's bullish or they've deconsolidated and that's bullish. And then you mentioned um, other areas where m a is sort of critical. Can you guys talk about where in your coverage you see m a uh, acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions as a positive when a company's doing that and kind of like that's important to the business model and that's key and where it's actually a huge headwind and where you really like would make you very nervous um, about like a company going after or anything like that. Hey, I'll, I'll start with uh, the latter point, Ami, about what makes us nervous is uh, when a company is uh, it, it, it trades at a valuation that suggests it has a lot of organic growth, lays out growth targets, and then has to go buy companies to justify. I think you've you've probably encountered that a few times in your your long and uh, uh, you know uh, um, high profile career, but. Uh, yeah, so uh, that in mind, I look at two of our shorts in the Hotel C Corp side, Marriott and Choice, who uh, both we think are going to miss long term, and and Marriott usually does miss their long term net unit growth targets. Um, but we see a lot of pressure for some of the reasons I've discussed. Uh, Choice is in uh, the same boat uh, for similar reasons. Both have made acquisitions uh, recently, and I see more acquisitions coming up uh, for both of those companies so they can hit these uh, net unit growth expectations. But uh, it's not like Hilton, who is doing it off their balance sheet. It's these companies have to actually buy the growth. Uh, so we look at uh, Choice, you know, they bought Radisson Hotels, which nobody else wanted to buy. By the way, like when, when these brands come up for sale, everybody looks at them, right? So it's it's the winner's curse. You know, whoever's bidding the highest gets it, right? And, you know, Marriott's made, uh, uh, you know, a few acquisitions and, you know, we think there's a decent chance a choice ends up buying Wyndham Hotels because uh, Wyndham's in a, in a better spot than they are, and that'll provide uh, net unit growth that they can't uh, you know drive on their own. So that would be my example of uh, of M and A being uh, a warning flag and, and a big issue. I think um, probably the I'm looking at my subsectors probably probably the subsector where uh, you know you see uh, most value destruction, at least relative to sort of expectations, right? Relative yeah. to what value is already you know, in the stock. Um, I, I think like, you know, if you look at like a company, like a smaller company on the retail gaming side, Void Gaming has always done fantastically well on uh, making acquisitions. Now they haven't made big acquisitions, but they've bought properties very cheaply uh, and they've been able to um, really turn around those properties. And and Void used to be the worst management team in regional gaming. And now they're the best operator. If you look at margins or uh, or win per day metrics per slot machine per table game. So it would make sense to, for them to buy uh, certain assets um, and uh, and be able to effectively run them better. But it's not game changing, I don't think. I think you've seen most of the consolidation already happen uh, on the casino side. Uh, there could be smaller acquisitions, but I don't see a lot of, uh, of bigger ones. Uh, I mean, the REITs, a lot of people will point to the REITs as being... Uh, you know, an industry that could, the hotel REITs that could be consolidated, which would obviously help the multiples. The problem with the REITs is that they're all carrying huge debt levels. So it's difficult to, to make these acquisitions really work. I think we're a ways away from from seeing that happen. Uh, and with that, Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Um, 
you know, if there's any uh, anything I'm missing on uh, maybe on the positive side for for acquisitions, I'm not sure there's a whole heck of a lot out there, but it's not that. Yeah, I mean, I I, I would say just on the on the regional gaming industry, that cycle of M and A and consolidation that we had from basically 2010 all the way up until pre COVID, like ultimately created a ton of value for the companies that are left and created a unique environment where we really have seen it since COVID, where you have basically four players, four operators controlling, you know, 65, 70% of these regional gaming markets around the country. And they all want the same thing, which is they're they're going after a high value, high margin, you know, high LTV customer. And there's not a ton of promotions and crazy promotional wars anymore. And a lot of it's because of the activity. They all wanted kind of the same thing. And Caesars, the CEO, really spearheaded this a number of years ago with El Dorado Resorts. Um, and that's, a, I think that's a really unique case study within the broader GLL sector of M&A really working out and leading to great consolidation um, and, and, and ultimately long-term uh, uh, sticky margins that are way higher than they used to be. But uh, in terms of what's, what's maybe else is left on the table... I mean, we'll probably see more consolidation, uh, maybe by M and A, maybe not in the online gaming sector. It's a, it's a very young industry, but moving very fast and following a lot of the international analog that we had seen either in the UK, in Europe, or in Australia, where either via M and A or just by virtue of uh, the scaled operators getting stronger and and those who don't have scale or fail to attain scale. Uh, just sort of uh, either go out of business or, or or gradually shift back to whatever their original core competency was. Not a direct answer, but I think you'll see more. It's a theme that we've been discussing with clients in the online gaming sector and this whole consolidation uh, view because there's clear and tangible uh, analogs that we have from, from international markets. Like eventually it's going to happen. I don't know if I would be so excited if say DraftKings went out and bought uh, a name that we like, by the way, and have liked for a, for for a long time, close to a year now. Uh, if DraftKings went out and bought something, they probably don't need to them or FanDuel, but there could likely be some consolidation at the lower end of the market. Um, long term, that's what that's what things have have shown us, and it actually would would prove to be a good thing for uh, for those that have uh, do have scale. And you know, it's a it's a market that's three three operators control close to seventy percent, just north of seventy percent of the market. So. The one one clear, uh, and this isn't this isn't speaking to uh, an industry trend or anything like that, but uh, to Sean's point about sports betting, online sports betting, BetMGM is owned fifty percent by MGM Resorts and fifty percent by an online operator, big one in the UK called Entain, right? So uh, uh, MGM has made uh, its uh, clear strategy, although it's backed away, but I think it's more been about price their strategy to own 100% of that JV. So, um, you know, there could be some consolidation, some some M&A if MGM were to either buy off the other 50% from Entain or go out and buy the entire Entain company, maybe retain all the international business, maybe sell off um, the international business and just keep the, the, the JV. But I don't think that would necessarily be indicative of a trend. That's a unique situation where you have a 50-50 JV in a fat, fantastic long-term industry where, you know, JVs uh, usually don't work over the long-term, right? There's uh, there's always issues, especially if there's, uh, you know, it's a 50-50 JV with one, you know, neither company having control. So um, there might be resolution there. One, I, have, I have a bunch of more questions here to fit in uh, in the hour, but um one quick follow-up to that, Todd, is when like a Marriott lays out their growth uh, horizon and then, uh, you know, kind of like hopes everybody forgot what they said and goes to buy something to fit in there. Does that work? Um, like do investors, when they report, uh, you know, non-organic growth as part of their top line, does everybody say like, oh yeah, look, they grew 21%. That's great. They're doing great. Or are people like pulling that apart? And because what happens with us, for example, is like even though everyone knows that they made an acquisition, um, the management team dances on a very fine line of gap and non-gap realities where 
like the actual ability, like they're able to say like, oh, no, 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 the acquisition wasn't that material. It was only 3% of revenue this quarter, which maybe artificially has some truth to it, but they're, but the base on the billings and the backlog and so on and so on, the things that really move the stock and cash flow is more like 9%, right? Because of all the accounting rules and things like that, or timing or things like that. So does it, does it work? with investors, institutional investors, when you kind of fill in growth with acquisition or are people smart enough and they pick it apart? Well, I think, I think in the past, because, you know, they, they, Marriott did do, uh, this, uh, city Ex- express deal recently, which juiced net unit growth. Um, however, we're also in a period, you know, post COVID where there's so much volatility in, in net unit growth, right? So we're not in a stable state. And so I think going forward, I think it's going to be more of an issue if if they try to because what what people will do is they're going to start focusing on the pipeline issues which they have not done and if you go back and look historically for all of these C corps they've had a terrific run of giving guidance annual guidance for net unit growth and hitting that target so if you listen to the conference calls like some of these issues that we're pointing out I think other people should see. But analysts are so used to, okay, they said it's going to be 4% or 5% net unit growth. It's going to be that. We're going to plug it into our model. Done, right? Um, now, there's a, there's long-term target issues. And Sean's gone back and looked at all of Marriott's investor days uh, over the last like seven, eight years. And they've missed all their long-term targets except for the ones where they actually made acquisitions, right? So, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting that the the guy who was in charge of their development all those years is now the CEO, uh, which we think is not not a great thing. Uh, but uh, my point is that until you start to see real weakness in the pipeline, our contention is you're going to have a quarter where you see a lot of deletions because all these developers that were given extra time to build hotels and PPP and all that stuff, they just pushed stuff back into the early planning phase and held on to that option, if you will, right? Um, but ultimately, the returns are not going to justify them building, particularly not with the Marriott brands. So I think what you see is you have the pipeline start to drop with the deletions. And then you're going to see the glass half empty. And then you're going to hear all the questions from the analysts. And that'll start. Over the past few quarters, uh, we've seen cracks in the pipeline. Nobody talks about it on the conference call. It's 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 amazing how you've got this one metric that's so important to the valuation that people are not even pressing management teams on. So to answer your question, I think it's going to be an issue. People are going to get smarter on what's going on uh, when they start to see some cracks in the pipeline and then see these companies buy uh, other brands for growth. Okay. I, I sort of have a follow-up to that. It's almost like... Um... Like a what if, um, Todd, you know, because uh, growth, like you said, has been abundant and therefore people who could outgrow everybody else, you know, you know we're winners. Um, and therefore all this and capital has been everywhere. So like just buying growth with capital is like, you know, kind of everybody could do, you know, 0% uh, bonds, et cetera. Now that we're in like a uh, much higher, like, you know, cost of capital, um, like a what if that I've been entertaining is like all these come and, and by the way I completely agree with your view on acquisitions in general we see just like you know kind of like trying to layer on one product that's built in this direction with a product that's built totally differently in another direction for different reasons it's just a mess usually it's a mess um, but um, but what if in this world where there's no organic growth because of high inflation and so on and so forth inflation stronger for longer uh, those who can use their own balance sheets to mint um, capital uh, to fund acquisitions and to squeeze faster earnings growth out of those acquisitions versus top line, could those companies, which we we both agree are like long term messes from a product perspective, could that be the the three year long that pair against everything else because it's just going to not move down type of thing because they'll able they'll be able to fill in their valuation with earnings growth as opposed to uh, everyone else who's relying on organic growth that slowly or very quickly have, you know goes away. I just a theoretical question here. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a really interesting point. 
and I'll first address uh, how that would relate to the C corps, the hotel C corps like Marriott, right? So both of, both Marriott Hilton and Hyatt, for that matter, the C corps, they're they're low capital intensive businesses, so the balance sheets are great, cash flow is great. We're we're, we're not knocking the the business model at all. So if you, under that scenario. And we've seen this in the past where the C-Corps want deals to get done, want um, hotels to get built. So they start putting in, they call it sliver equity to get these deals done, right? And the problem with that is it's always a signal that, okay, again, there's, you know, owners are, are having difficulty doing deals, getting done themselves. And now it has to get financed on the balance sheet to some extent of the hotel C-Corp, right? which may be the right strategy, may be a great investment, but the initial reaction is usually pretty negative uh, to that, right? And at the same time, it's a huge signal that, all right, the organic net unit growth, you know, the, the off our own balance sheet unit growth that's being funded by other people, there's real blocks in that, that pipeline, right? So it sends a huge negative signal. Um, so that's how I would answer that with the C-Corps. Now, if we were to look at the hotel REIT space, right? And let's say, um, you know, the, because right now there's there's very few hotels being transacted um, because the bid ask price is, their spread is so high. But if you were to see asset prices coming down, a company like Host would have a huge advantage on the buy side because they're one of the few REITs that has a, actually has a decent balance sheet. And could actually raise capital. Pebble Brook, seven times leverage. Parks, something like six times leverage. Like these companies have real problems. I mean, especially if you go into a downturn, right? There, it's going to be tough for them. They have to sell assets if they're going to buy assets. And and you know, so you're you know, if you're buying at a cheap price, great. But if you have to sell to raise funds, you're going to sell at a, a cheap price. Whereas maybe host could be in a different, a little bit of a different spot uh, under that scenario. Um, the OTAs are another business, very asset-like business, great balance sheets, you know, could could lever up. There's just not a lot, of, a lot to buy. You know, it's already consolidated. You basically have Expedia, Airbnb, and I mean, Airbnb is technically not an OTA, but, you know, it's kind of in that space. But, you know, you have, you have Booking and, and Expedia are the two dominant OTAs and nobody else is, is even close, right? So I'm not sure there's a lot to go out uh, and buy. Um, the, the casino companies, on the other hand, uh, they've emerged out of COVID with terrific balance sheets, and you know Sean brought up uh, some things that were really positive about you know their business models, uh, and 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 we like their business models. We actually think the cash flows are are undervalued uh, for for regional gaming companies and and the Vegas guys for that matter. At this point, it's just that with the regional gaming companies, we don't see we need catalysts too. We're not just valuation guys, right? We need catalysts, but they are also in a, in a position, especially like Avoid Gaming which I do think would like to do an acquisition and uh, they could buy something cheaper uh, than when they're selling at, use cash, still not have to lever up the balance sheet. It would be hugely free cash flow creative. That would be a good acquisition. You know, if they were to find something on the smaller side, I just don't think they can go out and buy like Penn Gaming or Red Rock Resorts because of regulatory issues, right? You, it's a different kind of market. You have these impediments on the regulatory side that you can't control or dominate, uh, you know, a given market. And, and now since Sean bought up, brought this up, like the industry has already been consolidated to the most part. So everything's going to be on a smaller scale, but I would welcome those kind of acquisitions, right? I think there would be a great spot if, if, if some of these regional gaming companies could, you know, find some strategic assets. It doesn't have to be that strategic either. It's just, you know, I could buy something at, you know, six times, seven times EBITDA and use, you know, uh, if you actually factor even with higher interest costs, uh, I, I'm not going to pay, um, you know, I'm not levering up, so I can probably get financing at a reasonable level, you know, at, at the current rates and make the deals very creative from a free cash flow perspective. So that could happen. Uh, again, it would be on a, on a smaller scale and you could finance growth. And in fact, I think Boyd Gaming is a company that's actually looking to do that, right? And is in a great position to do that relative to uh, maybe some of the other companies out there. Todd, listening to you, it sounds like you kind of like Boyd. Um, I do, and it's it's actually on our it's on our like neutral list, neutral. if you will, right? We had a Switzerland, as we call it. Yeah, sometimes the best performers. Well, it's been well, we have <laughs> we've had a we've had a buy on it for a long time. I mean, we 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 you know upgraded pretty early on after COVID, after it got hit, and you know we, we're, was positive. We were positive on it for a couple of years, um, 
everything's still intact, right? Like it's still, I was, I love this management team because they went from worst to first and they've been consistent. They made changes and they did a great job and they've emerged with uh, just too much cash than they know what to do with. So they buy back a ton of stock um, and their operations are terrific. They continue to keep their cost structure down and their capital allocation uh, strategy. As I mentioned, they've made acquisitions in the past uh, that have been uh, great acquisitions, You know, buying low, improving the operations. Our early issue is just the, the and I don't know if it's a comp issue or if it's a macro issue, but the the numbers, although they're well above 2019 on a year over year basis, they're flat to slightly down. So I don't really see a near term catalyst. Now, an acquisition could be that catalyst, right? So, you know, Boyd's always one I'm looking to get positive, not negative on just because of the quality of, of the company and their positioning um, and management team at this point. I love that because just pulling up the long term chart, Boyd's still at its YOLO highs or close. And you're like, screw that. Don't look at the technicals. Look at the, where the business is going. Let's you know cover up the chart. Don't look at the damn chart. Think about the business. This is a good business. It's going to a better place. I love those kinds of uh, fundamental views. Um, boys, I've kept you for an hour. I, I don't know if there's anything else you guys want to throw in, but to all of our listeners so far, you can tell that both Sean and Todd have a really strong grasp on the space. They're, they're excellent stock pickers. They make money for their clients. Um, and there's also there's always a lot to glean from like a conversation. So for those listening, if you can afford it, I always recommend going up to the institutional subscription level. Um, sales usually at Hedge I can work with you on that, but uh, it's always worth it because having a chance to talk to the sector head, you get a lot more nuance uh, and a lot more uh, color and strength out of it. But at minimum, I highly recommend uh, the pro, even just if you want to get your your feet wet and get started. Uh, with Todd and Sean. Uh, uh, boys, I'll turn it back to you guys. If there's any last things you guys want to mention or any points you want to ask or anything for us or uh, or we can wrap, it's up to you guys. Just a, a kind of like a last last thing from either of you guys. Yeah, I feel like uh, if I bring anything up, else up, I'm just going to open up a can of worms and talk for another <laughs> hour. So I, I, oh, I, well, Okay, well, the good news is that I, I, I was sort of lying and... The executioner has a question for you. Go ahead, Felix. Uh-oh. Hey, guys. Uh, Sean and Todd, you guys look good. Thanks for joining our show. I uh, always appreciate your insights. I know um, you guys touched on it a little bit earlier, but <clears throat> I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail on travel because there's been a lot of um, color on revenge travel within not just China, but Asia this year, coming out of COVID-19, uh, mostly it's from the Chinese travel side, but across Asia. What are the U.S. Uh, guys saying? What, what are the U.S. hotel management teams saying about um, recent travel trends in Asia um, in terms of you know maybe both outbound travel and also local travel? Within the indus, uh, within the country. So I, want, I wonder if there's any change in tone that you guys been hearing as the year has progressed. Yeah, I'm ju- just uh, progressively better, Felix. Like uh, both both uh, travel within China and just recently uh, outbound travel, and we can see it with our data and some of our forward looking data too. But I expect that'll be a topic on the conference call uh, for particularly for the hotel C corps that have that Asian exposure. Uh, and the OTAs uh, like booking, you know, booking has uh, has, a, has a solid uh, presence in in China. So I, I do think you'll see, or in Asia though, overall, I do think you'll hear uh, it'll be even better this uh, earnings season conference calls than it was last, which was better than the previous. So yeah, definitely kind of jiving with with w- what our data is saying. Like you know, we've been taking issue with uh, the management's commentary on on business transient travel where, you know, every quarter they're like, yeah, it's improving. And then we're like, no, it's not. And then <laughs> the next quarter, the numbers come out and it didn't improve. Uh, so that's one where I think you're going to see a change in tone, but I think uh, the international stuff, uh, particularly Asia, you're going to see uh, an even more positive uh, tone so far, notwithstanding, you know, all the the macro issues we, we hear about China, we are seeing uh, pretty good numbers and that's translating into better numbers into Macau as well, which I think is more of a function of access, this opening up access than anything else. But uh, yeah, so pretty positive on, uh, on China travel. 
Felix, one thing I'll add just from 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 my vantage and, and listening to all these conference calls is for about two and a half years, a lot of the management teams for US centric companies, not necessarily I'll sort of exclude the Macau operators, they were very hesitant to get bullish on the China outbound story. Um, it doesn't mean it's not a you know massive part of Marriott or Hilton's business, but it's a, it's a big enough part for when we're looking for incremental growth, certainly for the OTAs as well, Expedia and Booking, like Todd had mentioned, um, it can move the needle. And really the, the tone shift over the last, really in the year to date has been one of it's happening. We actually have real proof and we think it's for real this time. Whereas in 2021 and 2022, they all kind of got burned a few different times when they'd sort of pop their head up and think that uh, there was a sea change for outbound travel. Domestic travel had, had already been in recovery mode, but really that outbound component, the tone shift there. Um, and I think we'll hear it actually this quarter from from booking and, and Expedia to, to an extent uh, that it's actually happening um, and it's real this time. And there's probably, I think they'll be cautiously optimistic, but have some things to point to. Uh, whereas in prior quarters and prior years coming out of the recovery, there wasn't enough for them to actually say it's real. We see it. Forward bookings are good, et cetera. Um, so that's the major shift relative to, say, maybe last year at the same time where there just wasn't enough real evidence for them to say that the recovery is on and, and happening for China outbound and Asia travel probably. Excellent. Love that word, cautiously optimistic. I know when we were working... <laughs> We hear it every single conference call. Um, <laughs> great, guys. Appreciate the insight. Good stuff. I, I still miss Felix and Sean arguing about RevPAR. Back <laughs> up. Used to listen to that on a regular basis. I should just call him up like every week and just be like, let's argue about the Wednesday numbers and, and see what I missed in my quick assessment that I that I sent over to Todd. <laughs> One of my favorite experiences with these two was uh, we were on a conference call. I was driving. And uh, they were in my office speaking to me and uh, we hung up or they thought I had hung up and I hadn't. And I just listened to that too, just bicker back and forth yeah. for like 15 minutes. It just made the drive so much more fun. Oh my God. Oh my God. That, I remember that. That, that would have been gold. Good, good, thing, we, good thing we weren't uh, making fun of our boss or something like that. We were yeah. arguing with no, each you guys, other. No, you guys, that's what guys, happens. That, you that, guys get heated. But you got heated, but it was all about business. You know, no yeah. personal shots or anything. Just pure like argument about business. Wow. Really, really funny stuff. Anyways. Awesome. All right. We'll wrap there. Uh, this has been season three, episode 18 of Unscripted Equity Curiosity. Thanks for listening in and we'll see you next time on Hedge Eye Podcast. Don't forget to check out HedgeEye.com to get more actionable investing insights from our team of more than 40 research analysts. And check us out on Twitter at our handle, at HedgeEye. This presentation is informational only. None of the information contained herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or investment vehicle, nor does it constitute investment recommendation or legal tax accounting or investment advice by HedgeEye or any of its employees, officers, agents, or guests. This information is presented without regard for individual investment preferences or risk parameters and is general, non-tailored, non-specific information. This content is based on information from sources believed to be reliable. Hedge is not responsible for errors and accuracies or omissions of information. The opinions and conclusions contained in this report are those of the individual expressing those opinions and conclusions and are intended solely for the use of Hedgeye subscribers and the authorized recipients of the content. All investments entail a certain degree of risk and financial instrument prices can fluctuate based on several factors, including those not considered in the preparation of the content. Consult your financial professional before investing. The information contained herein is protected by United States and foreign copyright laws and is intended solely for the use of its authorized recipient. Access must be provided directly by Hedgeye. Redistribution or republication is strictly prohibited. For more detail, please refer to the terms of service at hedgeye.com slash terms of service.